processes that go through in my practice. Um, this work occupied me uh, when I came to a, a break between projects, I guess, um, and it was around a similar time to when I started, when I joined Phoenix and got my first studio. Um, so it was about kind of breaking down what I thought I made and how I made work um, and thinking about the processes that I go through um, for this project had a real emphasis on the, on the visual outcomes and, and less about the thinking uh, in, in a kind of backwards way. Um, so I started with what I thought was a simple theme which was just the colour red um, and I thought it would have a degree of freedom. Um, So this is the photograph that was part of the installation in the last, in the last photograph. Um, it doesn't have a title, I do something for my reference. Um, I, but I wanted to, although it maybe kind of speaks for itself, I wanted to draw attention to some of the details and how they came about and why they, they made the picture. So, um, first of all, the, the marks on the wall that kind of incidental in a way. Although I made them, they weren't made for the photograph. So the spray, the dots, was just the trace from when I sprayed the pegboard, um, which also wasn't made for the photograph really. And then the splats on the wall, um, although they kind of looked like a painting, um, they were actually made by accident. <laughs> I was uh, I was trying to make a painting by um, stamping on the bottom of the paint, and I loosened the cap, and I'd, I got it pointed at this this nice piece of board, and I went in for the stamp. I had a little audience as well actually, but the bottom popped off, <laughs> and I went all over my studio instead. But they came in useful down the line. Um, so yeah, the pegboard I'd sprayed red, and that was lying around, but I wanted to make something more obvious. And, and I played around with making this sort of curve, I guess, trying to make a sculpture or just make an object out of, out of something that wasn't much. Um, so that happened, and then I realised I needed to prop it up. I can't really explain that process. But that piece of wood was lying around as well, so I sprayed that red put it all together. And then came the kind of uh, the interesting bit where I try and make the picture. Um, I've tried to sort of describe this process before and it's it's quite hard because it's not it's not just about composing a photograph, it's it's not just setting up the camera and doing that. I'm really thinking about the space and, and how I'm, um, how the space is projected in the photograph or, or the other way around. Um, so it's, rather than documenting, um, it's, it, it's picture making. Um, it's a, a subtle distinction. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of basis of of how I go about making pictures, essentially. Um, so, sort of rocketing through this, 
I wanted to show the kind of the rest of the project or how it came together in in my studios. This is what I put up for the first open studios that was at Phoenix. Um, and I guess these these images document the kind of the second phase in my practice, kind of distinguish the two, or, although it's not so clear anymore. <laughs> Uh, so there's the kind of picture making and then there's installing. Um, I keep notebooks and I jot down ideas and I make little sketches. And part of that's because a lot of the ideas I come up with aren't always for pictures and they're not always for installations, they're kind of a bit of everything. There's a, a process of deciding what will make a picture and, and what will make a, an installation. And there's a big thing in my head about saving things for later. So while ideas come together in a piece, I can't always do it immediately. It doesn't, doesn't kind of work like that. So there's a constant play about now and, and then. And when I'm making pictures, I'm imagining how I might install them. But then when I'm making installations, I think back to how I made the pictures. So these kind of map out the space. Um, I've used sort of all aspects of it, all the different walls, the floor. Um, but also, they show how <coughs> all together the work sort of plays in between the, the, the various pieces between the photographs and, and the kind of the real space. So, like the, the copper pipe in that photograph plays off the, the pipe in the corner and comes together. Uh, yeah. In a way that sort of breaks down the picture plane and, and the real space. So I wanted to um, take you back a bit now to um, a much earlier project that I did when I was still, still at university. And I guess I kind of outlined how I go about making work. Um, but what I missed in that, that red project was like the real strong conceptual element to the, to the work or a basis in which to build a project. Um, and so this is a good example of how, how kind of the visuals develop with all this sort of conceptual thread. This is also a project where I felt that my practice started coming together and I, I sort of really realised that I had a confidence in what I was making and, and, and developed a sense that my work might have an identity, uh, if that's a thing. Um, so basically I realised that photography wasn't really cutting it for me alone and I ended up spending most of my final year at university hanging about the sculpture studios. I was a bit envious of my mates that studied sculpture so I uh, just popped from, popped from the bus to sculpture camp. Uh, I'd also been thinking a lot about ethnography and I'd been researching um, ethnographic field research practices um, and thinking about how, how it crosses over with art practice with the idea that artefacts and art objects um, share many qualities um, and similarities in how they're created and how they're understood. Um, so I had the realisation while I was hanging about in the sculpture studios and thinking about these things in other parts of my life that I'd stumbled upon a, a project. So I started taking my camera in the studios, um, shooting things, uh, kind of trying to look a bit deeper into where I was um, and maybe what 
what was presented to me by this this group of people that I didn't really know. Um, so this is a scan from the first contact sheet of this project. Um, actually, on on film with the medium for my camera. Um, I remember being quite pleased with these pictures. They kind of really got to, got down to where it was. But I took them to a crit or tutorial, and <coughs> I wasn't quite sure what he meant. But my tutor Jim said that they have the feeling of establishing shots. And I kind of went back and thought about it and realised that I was maybe the most boring kind of image you could be making. Something that establishes a scene and goes no deeper. So I had to sort of dig a bit deeper. Um, so yeah, I needed to learn and reflect a bit about what I was learning in the sculpture department. Um, and let's bring that into my images. So I wanted to be aware that I was making pictures in the manner of the sculptors at the same time as documenting it. Um, so this is to do with sort of framing the subjects in a way that um, gave them a clearer form or presence or a sculptural quality, even though I wasn't photographing sculptures, just potential materials or debris or the traces of human activity. I guess rather than documenting things and that be the subject of the photograph, I started to use the angles and the lines um, as, as tools to, to develop a, a, a thread throughout, throughout the photographs that I was making. Um, and I guess it developed into a process where uh, naturally I wanted to intervene in the spaces. I wanted to um, change things. I couldn't do it anymore with just moving the camera. So this is one of the first ones that I did where I didn't actually move anything. I didn't alter the objects in the picture, but I turned the tap on. And it kind of completed that, that line, the flow of things. Excuse the pun. Uh, but then it came in really important down the line, because this is a kind of now and then. <coughs> I collected a bottle of the water, thinking this will come useful later. <laughs> I still have it, actually, although it's half empty. Um, so this process it, it, it developed, um, although it doesn't look like it really in this one, but um, I actually did move a lot of things in this picture. I needed to clean it up, I needed to, to have what was important in the picture come through um, with more, more strength than how I, how I found it. Um, I guess that's a difficult one to explain as well, but I guess something like tucking the, tucking the fabric up so that it uncovered this and so that more of the fabric was visible and uh, rotating the magazine rack so that, so that the angles were right and taking a couple of things off the wall so that it wasn't confused in the top corner. But then it went even further, and and in this picture I, I fully like swept the floor to get rid of the dust and and moved a couple of the objects. So the lines come through that the objects are interacting in the picture, and, and I'm really beginning to make a, a sculpture or an installation, even though I did kind of find it as well. Um, So this picture kind of came to define the project in a way. Um, not, not quite sure why actually. I, I kind of put it down to the, the colours in it. Um, and it is what, what initially drew me to making the picture, I guess. Um, it's a very 
photogenic combination. Um, but actually, I had to return to this space multiple times and we'd re photograph it before it kind of worked. Um, and it wasn't actually, it didn't become about the colour in the end. That's not why, why I had to return it. Because the, the setup, the, the object, they seem to have a narrative about art school and about the sculpture department and these people. Um, and I needed to, to nail the picture, to, to sort of maintain this um, allegory, I guess. Um, so I guess it was thinking about the sort of tradition of still life, even though I don't know much about it, but I kind of knew enough. Um, but I guess in the end this was a, a not so subtle intervention. I completely rearranged it, although I took the object from very close by, it's one person's workspace. It's a, a constructed image. Um, but I realised that these interventions um, were a really crucial aspect in how I was reflecting and I was learning there about the sculptors. By the time I got to the end of term, they were clearing out the studios and in preparation for the degree show, I found myself with a bit of a playing field, empty floor space, not so many people and lots of leftover objects and materials. Um, so I had a great few days making the kind of final pictures of the work when I was really like in the flow of things. Um, and I began, began to really um, quite impulsively reflect on um, my inclination to make things which I hadn't really done before. Um, it was a bit of a culminating moment, um, which I thought I hadn't, hadn't really realised, but I was probably building up to. Um, and it really came across when I had to show the work. So this is my degree show, which I think I look back on in, uh, in a funny way. No, I'm quite sure the things about past work, but it, it they definitely sort of followed up some some little crucial um, things I've been working on or developing in my in my head that I had to kind of bosh out, I had to get it out of the way, get it out of the system. Um, these photographs couldn't be just shown on the wall in a typical manner; they had to be sort of off the wall and on the floor. Um, the picture of the taps, of the mops and the tap on the shelf. That's when the water came in useful. And I've had a puddle that dripped on the floor. It's not in this picture actually, because the shelf is <coughs> um, So yeah, that's the kind of following through of the now and then. Um, so I want to quickly sort of rattle through a, a project that I did. Um, maybe the first sort of um, major project that I've done um, since leaving that kind of comfortable setting of university um, and it was quite, quite tough really um, but I guess I, I found myself in a position where I was uh, I was living in a really shit rented house and working in B&Q and trying to be an artist and I had a lot of frustration building up in me and uh, I guess through the boredom of my job and an urge to just sort of fix and make my house better, uh, I started making work um, and there we, the pictures were made using the objects that were quite close to home in terms of where I was working, but also in terms of what I wanted to be doing practically. Um, so it's about DIY. The project was... The, I called the project DIY Dreams, which I'm not sure I like anymore, but it did, it did 
work well at the time. Um, the, the, the objects and the materials you more commonly find in a garden shed or a skip. Um, but the compositions um, reflected for me a kind of um, the, the melancholy um, but comedic aspects of a botched job or um, or trying to do a job with the wrong tools but you kind of enjoy it and yet you're doing it with confidence um, yes I, I guess it was uh, using objects of a kind of defined utility um, to make things that, that paid attention to the, the overlooked sort of craftsmanship in, in the home. Um, it, it kind of allowed me to play out my DIY impulses, um, but in the studio and in kind of, yeah, an inappropriate environment, I guess. Um, but the objects kind of had a language of their own, which was funny to work with, but I guess I was playing with a, a subject, um, and so there were maybe themes that I was finding quite hard to project. Um, <coughs> this, this piece seems to sort of tap into ideas of the home and family. Um, I think when I was working on the project and thinking of new pictures, um, uh, I, I thought about my parents' shed and, and maybe items. <laughs> I don't know why. I think sometimes the objects that you find in being Q are, are then. Mm, <coughs> they're, they're important and they have that value, not, not just because of their function um, or their sturdiness, um, but because of their recurrence in, in the practice of home improvement and in the home. And it's necessitated often by keeping up a home or keeping a family, and they become weathered and familiar. So this, this photograph was using things from my parents' shed. The bucket, I remember, as a kid, just for some reason, I don't even know what it was used for, but the, the colour was quite distinctive. And so when I went to try and find it and use it, I then came across all of these other things that, that kind of felt the same. Uh, and they seemed to represent more than, than what they were. Um, So when it came to this sort of second phase where I made the installation, I needed to build on that, the kind of sensitivity of, of it and about it being about family and the home. Um, and so I, just by chance, I found this ladder in the flea market that was identical to the one my granddad had in the height of his DIY, I don't know, career. <laughs> Uh, and it's a bit of a standard model, and it's something that people could warm to because it's just a ladder and it's got all the paint splats. Almost a ready made for me, but um, it worked with the photograph and it worked with the feel of the piece, and uh, the materials are soft and the colour is, is pretty nice. Um, yeah. But then the show also had other pieces that were of a very different feel as well. So this one is quite kind of harsh and the lines and materials aren't very soft at all. But this was again sort of exploring a different side to the same materials and um, things from the same uh, process. But this piece in particular was about trying to fit in with the setting 
I showed this at the Regency Townhouse, which is a historic building and uh, quite hard to work in, partly because it's historic and you can't really touch it or do anything, but also because it, it's really grand and it's um, very highly decorated and so it's quite a distraction. So I, I wanted to use the materials that fitted in with, with, um, with the surroundings. So this foam kind of mirrored the, the colours and the textures of the marble. Um, so yeah, that kind of brings me to, not chronologically, but it brings me to where I am now and, and some work that I'm making. Um, and I have been making for about a year and a bit um, since the, the general election last year in June. Um, so I guess it's a political project, but, but um, I shy away from that description because it, it's... Um, It's more about our relationship with politics and politics itself. Um, in the days that followed the, the result that came out, I, I couldn't quite work out what it all meant. Um, part of me wanted to um, go along with the buoyance of, of the left, who had kind of got some unexpected gains in, in votes, but, but it was still disappointing because I didn't win. Um, and then I had a kind of unashamed glee that the Prime Minister had been a bit complacent in calling the election and then, yeah, lost, <laughs> lost the majority. Um, but then it was all marred by the fact that she still had the power, she still had the government. Um, so this is when I, I kind of had a lot of realisations about the political system, I guess, and, and realised that I wanted to understand that more our relationship with politics and make work that kind of addressed it. Um, so this is one of the first pieces that I began then, but finished it more recently. Um, it started with the brick and the sellotape um, and I attached it to this spindle. Um, I guess it was it was about using sellotape as a simple metaphor because it's something that we use as a quick fix. It's something that, that works and we trust. But actually it, it, it's not permanent. It doesn't it doesn't do the job at the end of the day. Um, but then the brick uh, speaks for itself, it means so many things already. So I was using quite a complex object that has so many connotations. Um, but I wasn't put off by that. I think it's easy to be put off by things that are so complex. But the sellotape was the defining sort of part. Um, but the brick hung in such a precarious way and the sellotape isn't ideal but it's all we had to hand and we had to make do. <coughs> I guess that's the... I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in its first iteration it was, um, the wood was set in but the spindle was set in a block of concrete and um, I etched into the, the four faces um, there we have it there we have it um, which picked up on a comment that an MP made um, in reaction to um, the results of the election it's kind of picking up on this complacency and it really stuck with me those words um, and although, although the words aren't attached to this piece now, there we have it, kind of summarises the whole project. There's a lot of things that are just given, that have just sort of provided a lot of 
and things that have their own language, but it ties together in this feeling of, um, I don't know, almost hopelessness. But, uh, yeah, no, but this, this iteration, the kind of final iteration of the work, <coughs> came together when I, when I heard some different words in, a, in another political interview. But it was a bit of a clutch moment because I also found this um, this photograph that I'd taken when I first stuck the sellotape and the brick to the spindle. And I realised that the brick had its back facing to us, um, kind of turning away. Um, and the, the words from this interview came to mind and it was about false pride. Uh, I needed it that. This is another piece that I worked on quite early on. The same ladder that was in the previous project, sort of recycled, but stripped down, dismantled, so it didn't really have a uh, function anymore. It just sort of represented the ladder more than being a ladder. Um, but this, I guess, is quite, quite easy to think here. I was thinking about strong and stableness. And, and, um, Without the without the shelves, without the, the brackets, it's not really a strong statement at all. And but it resembles a ladder still because of this, this fine piece of wood, <coughs> which um, could snap at any moment, although it hasn't yet. Uh, so I guess uh, using this loaded object, this ladder, which speaks for itself and has so many associations. Um, but I like it because it's easy to, to read, it's recognisable, and it's, just, it's simple in that way. Um, it's open, I guess the piece is open for interpretation, but I'm providing a very clear uh, direction of thought. Um, I guess again it's sort of fragile and precarious. Um, is this is the photograph I made more recently. Um, and I guess again, again there was something very obvious about the image, it's a water leak. It's something we might see every day, but I didn't really kind of point it out. The, the arrows were pointing it out, and I thought it was, although I know what the arrows are for and why they're there, it still seems absurd that they're pointing out something that's so obvious. And so in my photograph, I'm less pointing out the water leak and more focusing on the arrows and, and uh, reading into it maybe a little too far. Uh, I guess the, the crack um, could be like money slipping out of the city into offshore tax havens or people at the fringes of society slipping into homelessness. But that's a bit of a stretch, but it comes from. But then the big blue arrows are pointing out this problem for not fixing it. And this one comes back to blue tack again, but also this sort of strong instabilness and um, and bricks. But it's building a kind of totem, it's building something that's, that's strong and has a real clear form and um, uh, I guess what was important is where I took it as well, kind of walking up the hill between the Phoenix Estate and Hanover and it's so residential and, and the materials in the photograph are so recognisable as where people live and where we, where we walk through every day. Um, this is sort of currently in an installation in my studio with um, a piece of broken glass in front of it that's stuck together with sellotape. I'm not sure if it works, but it's still, still working on that. Um, well, I think all of these pieces I've showed before may be kind of like negative they're looking at the doom and gloom side of our political situation and maybe 
Look at how I'm really sort of not enjoying it so much. Uh, almost like a, uh, I don't know. Um, but this piece really looks at kind of the idea that the grass is green on the other side, even though it's kind of negative as well. But but I guess you're looking through this this gap, this garage where it's quite a dilapidated scene with the, the weeds and the rubbish that are overflowing cans and a bit of a an overgrown garden. But then you see this incredible view of a sort of sunset over a hillside and, and it's so unexpected and um, there's a slight absurdity in that as well, a, a, a pleasant um, absurdity. Um, kind of, I don't know if it sounds cliché, it's a bit of a glimmer of hope. Um, we don't know what's around the corner, we can only predict, but I guess we can sort of but on the rose tinted glasses. Um, so another part of this project is that I've taken sort of photographs around the streets, like the last one, but picking up on words as well. So like I pick up on words in the news and the Prime Minister's questions, I also pick up on road signs and things. So this is about there being one way. Um, and it's a blue sign, isn't it? But it it really sort of came into play in this this piece that I'm, I'm developing. Um, I guess this is I'm at the stage of the project where I'm starting to think about how I install these objects and bring them together with images. And so I've brought in the arrows from the water leaf picture. And I brought in arrows from the end of a roll of sellotape. Mm. Um, and they're kind of competing with the photograph as well. They're, they're going against the one-way sign. The little red arrows are part of a unit. They're, they're like a, a small army. Um, and the big arrows have been attacked and painted over. Still not quite sure where. Well, where this comes from either, I think maybe there's too much impulse coming through now and I'm not, uh, I'm not quite at one with my own thoughts and feelings. Um, but I like the sort of progress of the project and the work in that sense. It's kind of coming together when I'm not quite aware of it. But it brings me on to the kind of a final image, because I could carry on for a while. But with all this talk of sellotape being kind of a quick fix, um, I wanted to show this picture because it's really sturdy and it's a real unit. There's a lot of strength in the kind of combining of objects and the mass of sellotape and so much blue tack <laughs> sticking to the floor. Um, and yeah, it's, it's standing strong in, in the face of adversity. The adversity of my studio and bricks. <laughs> uh, but it's, I guess, <coughs> strength in numbers, and I think that's what I feel we need. So I need to get that. <laughs> Installation. Mm. Uh, you have thought of taking that further, kind of repeating that, I think you're right. There's a word for that, and I learnt it last week. <laughs> I can't remember. What it is. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I've been asked that question mm. before. Um, I think because it's quite a big process in the first place, bringing a photo back into an installation. Um, I'm not sure I need to do it again. 
and also I guess I'm thinking about the idea that objects and, and the images are kind of equal parts and so maybe repeating that process with maybe prioritise a certain aspect of it it's a hard one to answer I think but yeah <laughs> something like that also the, the, the ladder when it was stripped of its steps yeah. etc and it was a fragile object see that you left it red mm. um, whereas you referred later to the blue arrows etc <coughs> did you consider painting it blue? Well, it was blue in the first place, and I oh, was it? stripped the paint off, oh, and I repainted it. Um, but oh, yeah, on. no, I think that's that's actually something that I have a bit of an issue with with that piece because the colours, um, the colours are so loaded politically, but it doesn't quite make sense in that piece. There's a bit of that mm. conflicting, conflicting symbolism. Um, I was hoping no one would notice. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I can't ignore it myself. Um, I'm thinking about making the ladder strong again, making it usable, or stripping the paint off again. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, can I just mention the? Um, you, you, you said about some of your images were political and um, reflected your sort of mixed euphoria and disappointment mm. at the general election. And the, the, the previous image had the large blue arrows and the also the blue arrow one way and then the, mm. um, the, the red arrows. And I wonder whether there's something political in that. Whether the, I think, if I remember rightly, the Labour slogan was for the many and not the few. And, mm. and you've got many red arrows and just two large blue arrows. and it's, we were still we still went back to the blue, back to the conservative, despite perhaps this gain in, yeah. in in Labour's popularity. And I wonder whether there's anything. Well, that, your your points that were definitely thoughts when I was making it, but um, I guess in this there isn't really a winning side. It's not like an election, and the painting isn't like a um, like a political election. Um, but the ideas of, of many and few and the, the scale of it, the fact that the blue is so big and has a much larger presence is hard to ignore and wasn't unintentional. But I think what I enjoy about this is the fact that the, the arrows, the big blue arrows are quite awkward and they don't look nice in the composition. They don't they don't work within the kind of the artwork, whereas the the red arrows kind of they're quite satisfying as a unit. They kind of really repeat each other. Yeah. So there's something about um, yeah the image working as much as the, the kind of symbolism. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you're doing a talk, you're revealing the behind the scenes of what you're doing, and mm. I really like how you engage your thought process, and I find it fascinating. But when you exhibit your work, mm. how important is it for your drivers to come through, or do you just leave it that it is what it is? Do you give any information away when you exhibit work, or um, do you leave it to kind of make its own mm. presence known? I don't give a huge amount of information normally. A few kind of pointers are sort of establishing what what it's generally about. But I guess it's actually something that I've been working on with this work, thinking about what I'm showing and how easy it is to read and how easy it is to understand. When I said that it maybe isn't a political project, it's because my experience of Photographers making things about politics is, uh, is very hard to understand and it's very dry and it doesn't clarify anything. Whereas, even though this work maybe doesn't clarify anything, that it's leaving it open to interpretation. And so, also with the title, or the working title, There We Have It, it's about it being there and it's open. Maybe just saying that it's about 
eco politics would be enough for people to read into it. I hope. <laughs> Maybe there'll be more questions later. I mean, I, <laughs> what, what I'd say is that your, your work has got a sort of beautiful aesthetic about it. You know, you sort of work a bit like a painter. You, you've sort of got that marriage of the sort of found material, but then you compose it. Mm -hmm. You strip out, you edit it. You strip out, you try and finesse it to make it clear. And I think, and yet, of course, the subject matter actually, without your description of your process, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily mm. understand what it is you're doing, but you make just beautiful pictures. And I just think that's sort of interesting you know, enough. Mm. That's <laughs> what I think. I mean, anyway, that's it, really. That's any, uh, drink and back in <laughs> 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So I am scribbling notes and I'm realising I'm in quite a mess here actually. <laughs> so I don't quite know how this is going to go. Um, so I really enjoyed Tom's talk. That's, that was uh, really good to hear you talk um, after chatting to you sort of week before last. It was really good to sort of hear who you speak about what you do. Um, so um, and I can see that there are connections between our practices, all very, very, very different. Um, so I'll stop shaking, maybe. And um, so what I've done, what, what I was going to do was have this neatly packaged in five different themes. And then in my panic, I realised that my themes all overlap and all the, all the works overlap. So um, I've selected a few works across my practice which tease out recurring themes and concerns. And I'm hopefully going to talk about motivations. Um, so in 50 slides time, hopefully, um, the title will make a bit more sense in limbo. Um, and to begin with, I've got sort of like a preamble of four slides, just to sort of try and pinpoint a few things um, that I think are quite sort of foundations of the practice, I suppose. So I've got... Uh, Two wedding photographs, one from my um, nan and granddad's on my mum's side, which is the war photograph. They got married in St Peter's Church. And my mum and dad's wedding in the 60s. Um, I still have both wedding dresses. And in my family history, I would say, I would describe that there's a love for materials and things that are well made, whether it was by job or by necessity or by pleasure. So this is me. <coughs> um, the photographs on the, the long strip on the side um, are me with um, dresses that my mum made me and she also made dresses and clothes for my animals and dolls, so that idea of making and remaking. Um, and the other thing that um, I think is quite important is um, my first long haircut at age 11. Um, so I went, I was on at my mum to cut my hair and uh, got her to cut it although she didn't want to. And what she didn't tell me at the time was that she kept that hair. <laughs> so this is my age 11 hair and I still have that hair. So there's that idea of keeping stuff that's quite um, significant. And so hair seems to retain a connection with the person, even though it's not, not, on, not on the body anymore. So it's detached hair. Um, and night clothing, her power, there's power around hair and clothing. Um, so, so hair's given as a love token, memorial, and, and sort of used in religion. Um, and hair um, 
clothing has um, the idea of a, if you own someone else's clothing, like if you own someone else's hair, you have that power or that control almost over, over other people. So I, was, I suppose I was questioning whether my mum had power over me if she was holding my hair. But, um, so the other thing I can remember doing at school was um, weaving these little weaves. Um, sort of, so I say this is my first weaving um, at school age, possibly at the time when I had my, got my mum to cut my hair. Um, I made many of these and using my nan's leftover wools from her knitting. So it's just a kind of intro really, I suppose. Um, I describe my practice as textile based. Um, I think like most artists who use different, who haven't got a linear way of describing their practice, is I always find it quite difficult to describe what I do. And you, just, you start to describe it as textiles. Maybe it isn't because I do what I don't just do, just don't make things, it goes elsewhere. Um, so I had an interview with Catherine Harper who um, did a studio interview with me and she and it resulted in um, a publication which will be going throughout this year um, and she described the work as multi-layered material and performative and it made sort of perfect sense you know sort of 20 years down the line it sort of made sense that someone kind of summed it up in that way so I would say that's what I do actually is a multi-layered material performative practice much to my surprise I think. <laughs> So I, I, um, I make work, um, I, I, I like to make things well, and this work is called I Lost Myself Because I Thought I Wanted to Be With You Forever, so an anti-form which is a nod to either Hess's sculpture installations, um, sort of emotionally <coughs> charged, and although exhibited, it's still not finished, so the work's often in transit, transit and it, in a state of becoming. So the work um, uses an upholstery cord um, as a so the dark the darkness that you see the strings that you see is upholstery cord so they're relating to a domestic environment and the the pointing to areas um, so the rest of the stuff is is multiple uses of clothing which is then broken down and then woven. So the work deals with sort of body boundaries, femaleness, and reclaiming um, a body image. So the weave is um, used as language as well as a method to reclaim and to re reconstruct the chosen clothes as raw materials. I describe the weave that I do as freefall weaving. So you don't. Um, Actually, I'll talk about weaving a bit more later, actually. So in the foreground, you've got um, wasted, wasted. And in the background, you've got legs, uh, as you can see. So wasted, wasted, an anti-form sculpture, um, part of a series called Offerings, dealing with the body and time-making, material meanings and process, processes are critical to the work. And the work's made in two spaces, so one in the studio and one in the gallery space. So Wasted, Wasted uses um, a ribbon and draws on ribbon history and the meaning means around ribbon history. Silver grey ribbon is loaded. It's about end sex trafficking, abuse, mental illness, to name a few. So the the yellow and the black and the orange areas are actually fragments of clothing and they are sort of around the waist, waist areas from, from those clothing. Um, legs uses woven tights and it's a nod to Louise Bourgeois uh, legs, rubber legs in the Tate Modern. So I suppose the works, so they go from the studio making environment into the gallery space and, and the work grows so that they start to sort of trans, transform and grow into themselves. So areas like the zips, seams, um, bodice areas are sort of part of the work so they, they give, give a nod to the integrity of the original garment.
So Lippy Excess and Unruly um, use hair mainly as well as um, makeup cases and tools associated with the upper chin and lip area. So the, the, I started using hair in about 2012 and the reasons for using the hair is, is the, that connection with the clothing, with the clothing that I use in the more sculptural pieces, you find hair, hair from the, other people's hair and hair as a material, raw material, it's, only, it's loaded with, with meaning. And it's also got a long association with, with the female. So these particular three are obviously about the taboo subject of the female body and facial hair, which um, so you seem to be able to get that idea of the hair removal attempt to control the monstrous out of control body. Um, the unruly and excess, so excess is in the front, the lip brush, and unruly, they both use my, my own hair. Um, couldn't do that with Lippy because um, it was too coarse to use. So they both use weaving techniques, so it still relates to the other work. So sort of thinking about hair and the female body and femininity, there's other, other works that... Um, or sort of the history behind hairs that I relate to. Um, you've got, um, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair in self-specific musical Rapunzel and the idea of um, sort of letting go in, um, in the fairy tale Brothers Grimm. Um, Lady, Lady, Lady Godiva who, um, the saying was uh, that she rode through Coventry naked in rebellious of her husband's uh, law around taxes and waist hair sort of normally sort of that, dis that idea of something that's disembodied in the wash basin. Um, Loving Hair was a performance piece that um, used hair dye and Janine um, used the hair dye to paint the, the gallery floor. Um, Trying to explain how you get to what you do, I suppose I was trying to think of. Um, so in my second year of my degree, I came across, I started to use clothing, that's when I started to use clothing for various different reasons, but one thing that really cemented the thinking was um, Polish artist Magdalene, who I can never pronounce, um, <laughs> they're huge um, woven seasonal garment pieces. Um, she died sort of last year, unfortunately. And um, the other thing that I came across was the conceptual clothing catalogue, exhibition catalogue, which was such at the icon and toured for a couple of years after 1987. And it was about clothing <coughs> in a conceptual manner, and um, that that kind of cemented what I was what I was thinking about at the time. And the work that what I was doing at the time, what sort of kind of kicked it off, was. Um, using women's underwear and then cutting it up and then starting to weave and process the ideas of, of what that meant. Um, so you've got beauty on the left and skin and bones on the right. Um, part of what other things that were informing the work was um, reading, so reading around women's fiction and non-fiction writings, um, the beauty myth. So it's quite feminist based, but there was also um, a wider reading remit as well. So it's a group of works titled Intimate Foundations. Um, so they all used um, single garments in one piece of work, so they're quite figurative based. Um, and they, they deal with issues around the body, women's representation, and um, sort of the intimate image and the public image. So the intimate pieces would use more things like um, underwear, uh, women's sort of petticoats, and the outer sort of more public pieces would use things like coats and fake fur coats. 
So there's lots of sort of drawings on um, identity around clothing, basically. Um, so the top piece is called um, Bust Absorber, and the bottom piece is called uh, Second Hand Knickers Are Very Nice. Um, they, the, so the knickers were bought for 50p in a charity shop. So I'm showing this because um, they, they use underwear and it's the ultimate piece to represent the female body. Um, that idea of sort of the intimate and the personal and um, almost more naked than clothed and the, the fact that the clothing touches the skin and then displayed in a gallery space. So sort of stereo stereotypical female clothes. So walking around, um, sort of visual visual stuff. I sort of tend to log. So um, the campaign at the time was sort of late nineteen nineties of Wonder Bra. This is a fellow, and he's got three D glasses up a up a ladder. So I, I kind of, um, on the one hand, I'm sort of thinking, well, I should really be quite offended by this, on, on my sort of um, beliefs as a woman. Um, and on the other side, I actually find it really funny and sort of quite tongue-in-cheek. Tongue so there's sort of like a double-edged uh, uh, um, double thinking, I suppose, around the work, really. So I, I say that those, those things that just sort of run through are definitely sort of foundations of the practice, really. So this is an installation that was at um, Nottingham Castle Museum, and um, originally it was commissioned for an exhibition called Laceworks, which was um, 2012 to 2013. Um, so on the on the left, you have the secrets we keep from ourselves, and on the right, are they really blurry? Are they? No, okay, they're really blurry. Okay, so, um, so on the on the left, so on the right, um, you've got piece. We've got a piece at the foreground called. Um, God, I can't remember what that's called. Um, so the piece at the back is um, you'll miss me when I'm gone, and the piece. Oh, it's try not to breathe. <laughs> Um, so with the secrets we keep themselves is the piece that was commissioned and um, used um, Nottingham Museum's lace history and their archives and collections and that's what the work responded to. Um, the, the work then was, even though displayed, it wasn't finished, it was in, tram, in, in sort of brown state which was a phase that referred to lace when it was almost finished but in, it hadn't been bleached yet so I, I made, made it quite clear that the work in the exhibition was brown state and unfinished. So the pieces in Nottingham Lace archives that really sort of Grew me, I suppose, was 1869 to 90 to 1872 lace samples. So the Mortiers looking lace at the top. Um, they were made in sort of the late 1800s, and they were machine made. And I was quite blown away by the colour and the the beauty of them, really, and didn't quite expect to see them in so early on in lace making at that time. So it was uh, the lace jabots, which is around, around the neck um, and worn by men and women. Um, and the other thing that I was drawn to was the, the, the photographs of, of the women working in the lace factories. Um, no matter what decade it was, they were all doing the same thing. They were all sitting there, they were still checking, mending the lace in these particular rooms. And the only thing that changed was their clothing and that, the fashion of the clothing. So I started to see the lace as a connection point between the women from, the, from centuries of, of, of um, history of lace making.
the garments that were selected for for that particular piece were all um, petticoats mainly um, and negligees and nightwear. The, the criteria for the selection was um, that they had to have machine made details on, on the garment. There was one in particular that was called that was um, actually made in Nottingham um, and generally the, the garments were made made in England and um, from sort of 1950s to 1980s because it seemed to be the last era of Nottingham machine lace. So what you, what you see set up is, is me starting to select the garments to, to, um, to consider to use for the work. Um, so after the exhibition was taken down, I had the work back um, because I wanted to finish it. The piece, The Secrets We Keep From Ourselves, um, is now part of the Nottingham City Collection, the Textile Art Collection, which um, I sort of handed over to them in 2016. Um, the criteria to get a piece like this into a collection was that I had to somehow put together a document of 200 pages to, have to, to let them know how to put the work up because I'm not going to be around all the time. Mm -hmm. And once, once I feel that once something's handed over, I, I want, that's, that's, that's it. So it took me probably a couple of years, because I do other things in between, to, to get this together. Um, and I was actually really pleased to see that they recently put the work up in Lord Bryan's dressing room at Newstead Abbey in Nottingham earlier this year. And um, they made a pretty good job of the installation. So um, this is the work up in his dressing room, which seems to be quite apt. So as the title suggests, um, the semi-transparent transparent qualities of lace conceal and reveal at the same time. Sometimes things are best kept hidden, which I think sort of lace, lace does that clearly. Um, so part, part of the garments, um, outer laces were kept whole. So, in, um, so and the the black lace that you see is actually um, Nottingham Beavers lace that was bought from um, one of the last um, manufacturers of, of Nottingham lace. But he's actually ceased trading in, in the year that I bought bought the the lace from him. So it was quite. So the piece is quite um, quite a historic piece, really, and, and it's right that it should live in Nottingham now. Um, so all the threads had to be labelled, individually labelled, so they've all got a number and grouped so that they can put it up, take it down and, and store it, pack it up. So they need a team of two or three people, and it takes sort of takes about sort of five, five, five to six days, depending on how what speed they work. Really. So I like the strip back uh, bricks really against the textiles. That idea of hard and soft, sort of masculine and feminine, really. <coughs> So you've probably guessed I, I collect clothes, basically. Um, I, I've always had a love for clothes and interest in clothes, which probably comes from family silent sort of conversations over the years. Um, so I, I, have, I have a way of collecting in different ways. So I have a, a collection of, raw, of, of stuff that I call that's raw material and a collection that is, is archived, those special things that you can never replace, basically. So things that have been handmade or they're falling apart or they're just so mundane that they're almost to the rag bucket. But they're, they're something that's, that's something that somebody else's lives have sort of been embedded. Um, I collect from... Uh, charity shops and uh, vintage shops, jumble sales, uh, people give me stuff, um, which is quite um, quite special. <coughs> so other people's clothes have um, have that history. You know, it's been embedded in their lives. They um, part of their 
living memory, really, I suppose. Um, so I'm not very organised. My my storing of all these collections is in a, in a very good friend's roof, and um, I don't. I don't. Um, in my dreams, I would like them all labelled and listed, but um, that doesn't happen. So they're literally boxed in um, petticoats, night dresses, knickers, bras, socks, um, just very sort of basic, really. And when I go, when I'm starting to think about making something, they all come out, and um, I sort of what, find myself sort of going through them. Um, so clothing is very much part of our identity, whether you whether you whether you consider your clothes or not. You know, you wear we all wear clothes every day. You know, there's no getting you don't walk around naked. Um, so clothing day, um, which was to do, is to do with um, quite uh, sort of sort of trying to identify the dead really after sort of war really, and this photograph. Um, it just for me, it just sort of sums up um, what clothes are. You know, they're part. You know, they're so much part of, of people's lives. And the photograph above that's called Lost Clothes. Um, I I suppose um, I, I sort of photograph and sort of come across. You come across clothes that are lost in the street, so I, I photograph them. So I don't take them because they're not mine to take. But I I just have to have an image. So I've got. You know, an archive of photographs of clothes that I, I've come across, and the, this I never forget seeing this on the roof at Manchester Travel Lodge um, with the cigarette butts, and it was there's something quite sort of dirty and matted about them. So I go from sort of those sort of special sort of vintage dresses to things that are very ordinary, I suppose. Um, I collect things that are from sort of Victorian right the way through to present day has to, there has to be something about it that, that gets me. And um, so clothes they release a smell, they have traces of human touch, they're stains, body bodily fluids, there's an inside surface and an outside surface. Things fall apart, there's details, people alter things. And all of this gets churned up um, the clothes get tried on. Sometimes they get worn and part, they become part of my own clothing and then they go back to the other collection. So things get written about, very sort of basic notes. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm writing. I'm writing about other stuff that's going on. So they get drawn, they get photographed, they get photocopied. So there's a whole, so a real sort of examination, I suppose. So things like the seams, of, a, of the clothing, you know, things that actually sort of get part of the, that, that person's body, I suppose. It's almost like you, you want that person. <laughs> um, that sounds a bit mad, maybe. Just <laughs> obsessive, maybe. Obsessive, maybe. That's a better word for it. Um, so for, for those of you who, who don't... Um, weave or have anything to do with weaving. Um, this this is what this is my loom. So this is this is um, a, an upright eagle loom. One of its kind. It's about 10, 10 foot long and extends up to twelve feet. Um, it's scaffolding. It's metal. It's really heavy steel, solid steel. You need quite a few te team people to move it. Lost already. Is this in your studio? Um, not here. I'll explain. Um, um, I, I'll come to that. My, my, um, I'm, I'm here. I'm sharing a space. Who's someone's got, kind of let me share their space, and, and this loom is in storage at the moment, and it has been for a year, I suppose. Um, so this loom. So weaving, um, like clothes, is is part of part of everyday life. Really, you wear woven cloth. Your jeans are woven. Your shirts are woven. 
Um, there's a whole history behind weave, like clothing, um, goes back to before we see if you believe in all that. Um, the Virgin at the Loom, um, we, weaving is represented as, as something that's um, having a discipline and work ethic and attention to detail. Uh, weaving has been used in workhouses, um, cottage industries. There's myths around weaving. You've got the Greek myth of Penelope. Penelope wove by day and she unpicked by night so that her so to, to sort of su to stall any unwanted suitors while she waited for her, her the one that she wanted to be with to come back. So there's there's a, um, so that whole woven history is woven into the work. The other, the other thing that I think about weaving is, is that it's a structure, it's a construction. So this, the facade that you see was the, where the co-op was on London Road and they kept, kept the front of the co-op. Um, and I relate scaffolding to weave, that crisscrossing, um, warp and weft, structuring, construction, industry. My dad worked in the construction industry, so there's um, that narrative around that relationship. I hope this is making sense. Right, I am really embarrassed now. I wish I hadn't put that photograph in. <laughs> <laughs> what I was trying to get over was um, was uh, that I the I the, the clothes. Um, I have clothes forevermore. I, I don't throw stuff away, basically, mm -hmm. and I will I will hoard, um, which is not a good trait. So the night dress that I'm wearing in that bottom photograph in the late 1980s with William the Kitten um, <laughs> is actually the night dress that's used in, in up here and it's used in that work which is trying not to breathe that you saw in an earlier photograph. So I was just trying to sort of link where things sort of come into. So once uh, sort of the clothes are started to, they start to talk to each other and start to group, you know, there's a selection process that goes, they can go on quite for some time, really. So these clothes were selected in relation to 1950s ball gowns, handmaids, ribbon history. Some of them got used and some of them didn't. <coughs> So this is the loom now warped up with the ribbon. So the warp is the, is the ribbon that goes from top to bottom and the weft, warp and weft, is, is the, the stuff that goes from weft to right. So I, I weave in a, in a non-traditional way. I, I, tr I describe the way that I work as um, a free fall style weaving way. I break all the rules of weaving. Um, there are no edges, there's breathing spaces and everything's movable, cuttable. Weaving is a very slow pace. You can't make it go any further. It, it slows everything down. There's, there's quite a pace to it. You, you can't make it go fast. So the work in this way, this is what happens in the studio in a private space, and I describe it as loom state. Um, I work on these large-scale stuff for about up to about two years. And by the, by the, when it's ready to come off that loom, I usually do a public opening where people come and view, view the work on the loom before it's cut off. So there's that relationship between the hard and the soft metal, so masculine and feminine. Of course, you've got all the, the weaving mills, basically, sort of in England and Northern Ireland. So in England, you have the wool, the uh, cotton industries in Ireland, obviously the linen. And I see, see those women who operated those looms in those factories as, as, as sort of uh, communities. Um, and I see them embodied into the work that I do on that large scale loom that you saw. So I, I do try and sort of go and visit the ones that remain or remain sort of the premises. Um, so the weave opens up the body space. So it, it opens up a breathing space that you don't, weaving's normally two dimensional, it's flat. 
normally with your clothes and jeans um, but I, I break break those boundaries down so like like in boundaries of the body the, there's boundaries of weaving and edges that, that are no longer so there's an abstraction that happens with the clothing into the weave and it's about sort of reclaiming and reworking and reforming so just to give you a sense of something that comes off of the loom. So the um, so this is since I found the E and she's made up of this bit here, that bit there, and that bit, so she's that section there. So to give you an idea of the the scale that she, she grows into a, a space. So once the, the once the work's cut from the loom it's like a release. So you lose stuff that's in the studio, and then when it comes to the gallery space, it becomes something else. It starts growing. They take take their own shape, basically. So since I found for you, obviously it's about love, falling in love, and um, an emotional state um, that's being offered. And um, the title is 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 does come from. Um, there's a song called Since I Fell For You that Nina Simone sort of Billie Holiday. So it's about that, it's about that female sort of waiting almost, I suppose. So once the work's cut off of the loom and it goes into the spaces, they've literally collapsed pieces. I mean I I always think they look like squids sort of just hauled off of out of the sea onto a boat. So the performative element that comes so there's a performative element that happens in the studio, but then it also happens in the gallery space. And that's, I often, because the work takes quite a long time to install, um, I'm usually using part of the exhibition time to install. So there's a performative element to so working on site in front, of the, in front of the public, which is not always um, ideal, but I always find that quite interesting with that when you get people coming into a space and they're not quite, you know, sorry, we shouldn't be here. It's like, no, this is part of the exhibition. You know, seeing me, you seeing me put the work up is part of it, that time embedded in the work that's been in the studio space for two years and it moves into gallery space for another length of time. So in the gallery space, it becomes limbo state. And the idea of a transient piece of work They're just working on pieces in different sites, really. So each time the work's installed one place, it changes or grows or, or gets more finalised. Sometimes the work isn't titled for ages for, before it's um, been exhibited. So you've got a PP Petite... Um, high wire walker. So I, I suppose I'm sort of drawing on stuff that I, I think connect, brings the work where the work comes from, this is I suppose I'm trying to explain. Um, so walks between a high wire walker, walks between the twin towers of quite famously. So I, I associate that that tight rate tension with lean tension and the trapeze artist, trapeze acts, um, the idea of the work suspending and retensioning into the space and, and me in it as well, but obviously not flying through the air, but there's that, um, I'm up and down scaffolding to hang the work, um, you know, I'm on the, you know, it's quite, it's a physical thing, I, it's there, I'm there with the work, being very physical, so I, I don't let it rest really until I'm happy with it, it, it doesn't rest basically. Um, and we've got slumber, um, which is uh, when Janine, um, she slept in the gallery at night and then she wove in the day of what her dreams were. Um, and Cornelia Parker's uh, Maybe, her starring Stephen Tilda Swindon. I suppose what I'm getting at is I actually want to sleep in a gallery at some point. This is what I'm aiming for. I want to sleep with my loom in a gallery and, and um, see what happens, basically. <laughs> So I don't know how that's going to happen yet, but that's sleep with my loom, basically. That's what I'm wanting to do. Um, so another another sort of piece of work that uses um, archives and collecting. 
um, was um, sort of some work that was done for Unraveled um, Arts at Nyman's Trust. Um, so the work was about the mother and daughter, the Metals, um, Maud and Anne, and um, they were, you know, very, very creative women, um, obviously very high class, and they, but they, they shared their skills, so that idea of sh sharing their skills. So I made some uh, hair woven pieces, so you can see a thimble, a thread wrap on the sewing machine, um, and they were sort of like hair woven mentos around their skills as, as needlewomen, basically. So just to, just to go back to the hair, because I'm, I'm never quite sure how to talk about the hair and the, and the clothing, because they're slightly different, but they're not. Um, they come from the same place, really. The, so the hair pieces are, they are woven in, in not, not obviously on the big loom, because you wouldn't get hair that long, um, but they're, ho they're woven in a very different way. So they're woven on a smaller bead loom, or, or I find different ways of, of making them, basically. So they're a very, very different way of making to, to the large scale stuff. It, they're not as physical. I'm sitting very still like those lace women in the, in the lace factories, um, very carefully lining up hair, 16 strands of hair to make one warp, which um, it's, it's um, very tedious. Um, and um, I would sooner do larger scale stuff because um, I don't find it, I like to be more physical with the work really, more sort of embedded in the work. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the whole of Nyman's work, what I wanted to focus on was the, the film piece that went, so as well as the, um, as well as the small wave and hair mementos that were dotted around in, in, in a setup in the long gallery, um, at the other end there was an installation of a Wayman's garment sculpture and a film. Um, in the film, um, there was me. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, if you asked me 20 years ago, would you be in a film? I'd say no. I think so. I'm one of the shyest people ever, you know, and um, I'm not as shy as I used to be, obviously, but um, anyway, I'm there. Um, so, the, what I'm trying to do with the film was. Um, the film actually documented the garments that were used in the woven sculpture, which um, which is here. But um, I was really unhappy with it. I wasn't. It's a piece that I actually want to remake, re rework, basically. So um, really not that happy with it. But the film displayed alongside the work, um, the, the woven piece that I don't like, um, was was the piece really that I um, should have just left it. Sometimes you just need to know when you need to stop, I think, is, is the, um, is the uh, thought there, really. Mm -hmm. So the film is about a fictional character called, in, called Elsa Messel, so it's someone that I made up, and what she does is that she walks through the grounds of Nyman's in different clothing, so she, her, her change of clothing, a bit like Wonder Woman. She walks through the house and she changes into these different clothes that are meant to be reminiscent of the women who lived there. And then all those clothes were cut up and used in the woven garment sculpture that I should never have made, basically. So I have got that here, but um, if we've got enough time, we can play it, but if not, there. So I suppose, um, I suppose with that, I was just trying to, trying to explain my, re my own realisation of, of that idea of performative work, performance in the work. Um, so going back to the loom question, whoever asked that. Um, so this is um, my loom broken down, and it is in storage. Um, I'm sort of renting a small half um, I'm half space. I've been here about a year and a half, so similar to Tom actually. Um, and uh, obviously the loop's not going to fit in that space, so I'm basically on the waiting list waiting for my own space. Hint, hint. So, <laughs> um, and um, the loom's in storage, so, so when, when I've got my own space, I'll be able to bring out the loom. But what, what that's enabled me to do is to actually think about what the practice is, really, and how I um, may like to continue. So obviously there's work that I want to continue on the loom, and obviously want to take it to a gallery space and, and sleep with it all in the gallery space. But... Um, <laughs> The other thing that I've been doing is, is thinking about how else would I use that, that archive collection of clothing. 
and last year um, created a clothing seal which was at the Grange in Rotten Dean and it was um, a, 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 again it's about a boundary an edge an inside and an outside um, and the garments that were collected that was that were picked out selected were all these lovely ladies um, and then they were folded up onto the windowsill um, and the idea of sort of almost like sort of blue beard's bedroom um, and the clothes were selected in relation to a lipstick palette so they were very very um, very very female basically There was also sort of, sort of thinking there was sort of Angela Carter's bloody chamber as well. Um, I think that's me actually, that like rambling. starting points of work and I suppose I, I, I have to like the clothes to be able to want to be seduced to use them I have to like them yeah. <laughs> and that means the colour as well so I, they're, they're all colours that I would wear I suppose um, but the other, other starting points would be um, sort of referencing to a particular era or um, it could be it could be one garment that starts a particular colour palette going, I suppose. Yeah. Does that answer? But, I mean, I don't know why I'm asking this question, but it's, it's interesting me. Have you ever done any really navy blue work or green <laughs> <laughs> work? Or, I mean, it, um, I don't know. Sorry, oh, you know, I, see, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm just thinking, what colours have I? I suppose a lot of a lot of the clothes are. I mean, women's underwear and nightwear yeah. is, is flashy. You know, there's no, you know, unless you go for the, the black red yeah. direction. Um, I suppose I, I tend to go for the skin flashy, the more feminine mm. clothes that identify with with the females. Yeah. I think. Um, I have used men's clothes. And th I'm thinking about it, they were more dark and blue, but they were used in a very different way from the female clothing, I suppose, yeah. I think what's really interesting is both your use of space and within the gendered um, materiality of what you use in your yeah. work, which I think is, to me, has been a kind of stunning connection between you both. Um, I mean, I don't know how, I mean, is that a sort of um, what underpins a work? I mean, perhaps that's a question to both yeah, of you, right? Yeah. How you negotiate space. When you said that, Monica, you've got Tom talking about DIY and, and Lucy talking about underwear, you couldn't get more kind of. I don't think this is who you both are. <laughs> but very much. It's sort of so kind of polarised. A stereotypical view of men and women, isn't it? Which I'm, I'm quite sure is not who you are. Well, it's the, the constructed spaces yeah. where, where you're constructing the feminine, where you're constructing the mas masculine. And I think, in a way, you're doing it from a critical position. You know, there's a sense of, you know, these are, these are familiar objects, and, but somehow you're repositioning them within that gender framework, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, it's not really great. 
I think in, in my work, although maybe the objects maybe do have that kind of masculinity to it, but I would frame them as not always so masculine. I think often there's a bit of sensitivity that I try and bring out that I don't, I don't even want to go down the line of stereotypes, but it, it doesn't follow that neat thread of it being masculine. And, oh, um, absolutely. And, because I think, you're, you're, I think that's, you're, you are giving the critical yeah. positioning, and, and I think that's what makes it interesting. Mm. And there's a that's degree of fragility mm. about um, your representation of those objects. Mm. Mm. But it's interesting absolutely. with your work about the loom and, and the... I can't, I can't remember the term, but the thread that holds it together, the wall, the wall and uh, how that's used, that isn't always feminine, but your your pieces are, are women, aren't they? You refer to them as... Yeah, but yeah, they are, they are hers and she's very happy to say, but the, I think they're, um, they're the weave, um, I mean, there is a masculine side to weave, I think, as well. And the, um, I suppose the way that I use space is, is about making it female, I suppose, making its presence female, I think. I don't, know what I mean. I don't describe the practice as uh, a feminist practice at all, because I think it's... It doesn't come from that motivation, it comes from a making obsession practice. But, um, but obviously, it's very evident that it is female and about the feminine so. thing. Can I ask just to elaborate a little bit on you said that you made some work with male garments? Oh, yeah. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Because then that is, you've obviously gone into the man's side. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't wear them for a Well, I did wear them, but they didn't feel right. Um, <laughs> and I, it was, um, I've, I've, I've used men's clothes on two occasions. One, I started to use men's shirts because I, I felt that everyone was saying, well, do you only use women's clothing? So I thought, right, okay, well, I'll, I'll try men's then. And couldn't really do a lot with it. But um, an opportunity came up in Grimsby, which is a fishing heritage town. Um, quite a famous town and um, I did some work based on the fishermen um, or the, the retired fishermen on the trawlers and um, he used um, vintage fishermen's um, vintage suit jackets um, that were reconstructed into kit bags so the idea that the, the fishermen they were, were at sea for three, three weeks and then three days at home so the idea of that transition and that constant sea and land, feeding their families. So these these um, kit bags were made from the, the sort of vintage men's jackets. So they weren't woven, it didn't seem, I did try to weave, desperately tried to weave, but it just wasn't working. So it was about, so it was about reconstructing, so it was about taking the garment apart and then reconstructing it into a very solid sort of form a very readable form and then they were displayed on the trawler that's part of the museum so uh, so it was, it was done for a very different reason I suppose and it was done for a specific exhibition and that's, that was kind of my way in really in this very masculine town really that had this amazing heritage around fishing and these men, these very hardened Men sort of work sort of a very hard life as, as fishermen, trawlers, trawler fishermen. So it's um, so I interviewed the men, sort of chat, got to know the, got to meet, you know men around Quinsby and, and talking about their experiences on there. And, and their, so it's about a community again, I suppose, and the archiving and um, and again the, the clothing becomes their own identity. They are very proud of their clothes when they come on and off the, the boats. Um, when, I think uh, the fishing industry was up to about sort of nineteen sort of fifties, it, and it sort of diminished in the seventies. So the whole town was demolished basically um, in Geely, but um, I'm just wittering them on the way. So that's <laughs> <laughs> so that's another epic sort of um, project, really. That um, uh, I, yeah, I did just seem too broad, um, so I didn't include include it in this talk basically. 
on the subject of hair, do, do you know the artist Doris Sacchando? Um, who does, it, 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 I guess, sort of, it resonated with your work? Um, I don't know. Um, if you show me a picture of their work, I might see it. She does the concrete wardrobes and hair is kind of seeping on. Oh, no, I don't know, no, mm. no. Mm. I think um, uh, there are artists that really like um, the use hair, I can't remember who they're. Um, there's an artist who done, um, there's obviously Mona Hattin, and then yeah. there's an artist who done a, a wooden cotton reel, and she got her nan's, her mother's, and her hair knotted all these hair together, and they wound up. Mm -hmm. and that's an Irish. Kathy um, Prendergast. Oh, it is, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, so that piece has always stuck in my mind when I saw, sort of, um, yeah, there was, um, there's some amazing work with hair. Yeah, and of course Helen Chadwick as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of interested in the fact that you said you keep all of your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, these are some things that you've collected, and obviously there's family stuff, but also, I'm sort of thinking, the work that you make, do you see it when you were speaking about fishing as well? Is it like a form of portraiture where you're sort of possessing the owners of these clothes somehow and you're re-presenting them or is it, is it something else? Um, I mean, I know it is portraiture, but I mean, yeah. I'm sort of trying to... Because the other thing that interests me, you work really labour-intensive mm -hmm. and... I'm sort of interested to know whether you ever get to a point where you think actually this isn't working and you abandon it, or do you just work it through until it's right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so the. Um, so I know it's two very simple yeah, questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, but, um, but it's the way you sort of refer, refer to the work as her. Mm. There she is. She's looking lovely. Yeah. Um, um, so the uh, um, what was the second? Uh, uh, we'll uh, second one. Do you ever abandon? Uh, yes, that was it. <laughs> um, very rarely. Um, the if if it's not going well, it gets undone and then redone to the point of if if. I suppose the only time that something's abandoned is if it literally falls apart. So you can only weave something so much until all the threads of the of the weave or the knit go and um there's some pieces that i'd wish i'd just left you know sort of overworked and um but i have yet to throw them away actually i've tried to give them away but nobody wants them so <laughs> um uh yeah and then the, the first part of the question um i don't i don't think it's about a portrait of the of people um i suppose i, I try to i've always wanted to make work that that kind of relates to people in some way i suppose um i don't think it's about i mean maybe it's it's more i mean I, i'm aware that i that idea of that um, transference between me and the clothing and sort of that idea of sort of making it mine, sort of becoming mine in a way. Um, if, you, if you want to say no, it's not. It was yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I think I, 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 it could be, I think it could be, but um, I, I don't think, I don't think that's, that's the intention, I don't think. I, I, I like you? the um, expression you use of possession. Um, and I, I, I've been thinking throughout your uh, presentation about um, a piece I saw in Freeze, I think probably the last of them, which was years ago. Um, there was Mia Farrow's nightdress that she wore in um, Rosemary's Baby. And it was there in a kind of light box. It was way to put your height. And um, that, was, that was the thing about possession, was yours, your selected garments, nightdresses, and uh, lingerie um, are kind of more anonymous mm. and um, uh, about the anonymity of, of previous wearers or were they all second hand? 
Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Anything, I can't, don't, yeah. don't want to use anything new. It has to have that history yeah. that other person's lives embedded. Yeah. And it, it, is, it's, it is part of what has gone in within that garment. Yeah. 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 That's, that's history. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if I completely was misreading it, but I, I thought your work was very visceral and it sort of felt to me like it was sort of inside outside stuff, that there was always something like the stretching, like the stretching of muscles or sinews or, or something and that you were representing not only the outside but somehow the sort of visceral inside of the person, especially because your colour palette was sort of pinks and reds and and brown, so that, that so it may not have been what you intended at all, but that's how I sort of felt it was. That there was that inside outside. Yeah, that's, that's a really good sort of you know good interpretation because that obviously the inside body and the outside body gets is it's all there. You know, yeah, sort of it's all part of the it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and. Um, you know, obviously, men and women's bodies are different, so mm -hmm. yeah, um, for obvious reasons. But um, yeah, so that no, it's, that's a perfect observation. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you could have well, said, I've just said no. <laughs> Perhaps on that note, I'd like to thank you both, Lucy and Tom, for fascinating talks. Um, I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too, and um, there's more of this to come. Uh, 22nd of October, which is part of Brighton Fringe Festival, we have our very own Bernard, and um, <laughs> to be that's the other person. But I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight, and especially thank you, Lucy and Tom. <laughs>